Welcome everyone to the June 10th, 2019 regular scheduled Board of Education meeting. Uh, before we begin tonight, could we make sure that all of our cellular devices are turned off? And uh, with that being said, would you all join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have a, uh, I think, a relatively quick um, agenda tonight. So, uh, Lynn, if you could take roll. Yep, President Singer, she's absent. Vice President McFarland. Here. Secretary Baker, here. Treasurer Fidel. Here. Member Blasey. Here. Member Lauterbach. Here. And Member Roush. Here. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Moving on to item two, the consent agenda. We have 2.1, an approval of the meeting minutes from May 20th, 2019. Uh, regular and closed session. Uh, we have a 2.2 um, following persons have announced their resignation. Uh, those individuals are listed there. 2.3 payment of the school system's bills uh, in the amount of $12,374,257. And we have some legal invoices for payment uh, from the Thrun Law Firm, uh, both of which are indicated on the agenda. Um, can we get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Bill. Bill. Okay, item three, presentation to the board. Mike. Um, so as we have in the past, Michigan High School Athletics Association is a private organization that schools uh, choose to join. So we need to take action to do so. When you do so, it says you will abide by all the rules and you will help enforce them as they are not an enforcement agency. So um, so pretty standard practice. We need to do it each year. Okay. I move uh, that the Board of Education adopt the MHSA a resolution for the two Midland Public Schools middle schools and two high schools for the 2019-20 school year. Complete resolution shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Support. support. Moved by Phil, support by... Big Mary got it first. Mary. <laughs> Any discussion? If it was an auction, you'd, you'd be the buyer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all in favor? Okay. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. Item 3.2, we have a 2019-20 salary letter for the MPS employee groups, and that's going to be Mr. Cooper. Absolutely. This is what we commonly refer to as a salary letter. Um, it is basically setting and establishing the salary arrangements for all our non-affiliated groups in the district. Um, this year, uh, a little bit different. We do have our three affiliated groups, all with uh, ratified settled contracts, uh, running anywhere from through 20, uh, two to three years through 2021 or 2022. Um, in general, uh, the uh, unaffiliated groups are in line with our negotiated employee groups. Um, we do that because, of course, we're always looking ahead as we work with all our groups to kind of consider all our employees and where that will put the district uh, in the big picture of everybody that we do employ. So what you'll notice, uh, I know the letter's lengthy as it lays everything out, but in general, uh, two to three percent wage increases in there. The benefit package continues as it has been. Um, the HSA funding is the same amount, but we have changed that to uh, a different breakdown. Instead of a half in January and a half then in July, uh, we're going with two-thirds in January of the amount, the other third in September. And we found that better uh, fits our teacher's contract, too. And their length of employment, if they were to leave us, it seems to be a, a better funding pattern. Um, the other parts of the HSA, uh, if people s spend that part of their deductible, uh, they can always request that from us, and we would place that in there. And it didn't matter if we are splitting in half or doing the two-thirds, one-third. Um, the uh, only other category I'd mention is our associate teachers in the pre-primary program. Um, since that was brand new this past year, uh, as we worked at it, we just kind of set some rates but really didn't know uh, what the market was and what kind of qualifications they were going to have to uh, work in those programs. So we, we have realigned those 
uh, slightly to bring the associates, uh, not the lead teachers, but the associates into uh, align with what, what is common um, across not just this area, but, but in most areas. Um, so at this point, um, what I would be doing is recommending approval of these 2019-20 uh, wage adjustments as submitted in the letter. Okay. Thank you very much. This is an action item, so uh, we'll take a motion. I, I move that we approve the salary level letter for the Midland Public School employees groups. Support. Okay. Moved by Mary. Support by John. Any discussion by anybody? Thank you very much for that. I know a tremendous amount of work um, went into it, and it was um, great to see the ability to be flexible with the support staff and keep them in line with uh, the competition, so to speak, to make sure that we're retaining talent where we need to retain talent. Um, so that said, uh, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None? Okay, motion carries. 3.3, .3, Mr. Cooper. We'll get the uh, presentation up here momentarily. And the network's down. So, I could tell you about to present you the budget. Uh, <laughs> get a couple things out of the way for it. I could tell you that uh, I, I'll just start through. Uh, and I'll just do the first part that doesn't take a whole bunch here, and then we'll see where we're so at. You might want to go make a couple. Um, as you know, um, by state law, we're required to have a balanced budget. And I want to make sure I mention always the balance. Balanced budget means that it can include the fund balance that we have. It doesn't mean that your revenues have to exceed your expenditures. You just have to have the money that you can allocate uh, to have a balanced budget, and you must do it before July 1st of uh, every year. Uh, the difficult part in that always is the state doesn't have to have their budget done by that time, so this year will be an example of that, that they'll be working towards October 1st, and as we get in here a little bit further, um, I'll mention that to you that um, that October 1st date, we're just not sure if they're going to make it at that point or not, but uh, we'll have some good estimates. Uh, they've usually come in, even if it's the last minute. I think, Mike, you and I remembered one time they went a couple days past, um, but that's technically when their first state aid payment has to come in is in the month of October, so that will put more pressure on them. Um, a couple of things. I'll just talk about the timeline a little bit where we were. Um, we set our budget workshop in April, and then we followed up here at this meeting uh, with the actual budget for 1920. And I want to remind everybody we have a second meeting in June always, and there's a couple reasons. That allows us to, um, on the backside, you get to finally approve 1920, but you also get to approve the final 1819 budget. Remember, budgets have to be, they're not really advisory in nature, they really just reflect. Where's our income coming from and how are we spending it? So we do adjustments. So when we started 1819 last June, uh, we got to March and made an adjustment, and we make another adjustment in June. So actually, when I'm developing this budget, I don't quite know exactly where we finished 1819. And we're good enough to have a pretty nice variance at the end, so it makes it a little more difficult. We predict pretty well, but the variance is, is that money they give back at the very end that that maybe people are holding back a little bit, thinking they might have one more thing come in. So, so that, that will be coming up uh, at that uh, June 24th budget. 
Um, I guess I'll mention while we're at it, as long as I'm at that line, uh, one of the parts of the budget is to establish the uh, millage rates. Um, so I would at least uh, tell you in general that the millage rates, um, starting with the non-homestead, which was voted on, I think it's back in 2014 now, is 18 mills. That hasn't changed. Uh, still 18 mills. Um, the other two are um, ones that get determined on an annual basis. One is what we refer to as the hold harmless millage. That's because when Prop A came in, we were funded greater than that. It allows us to collect $415.31 per pupil. So there's two things the state al allows me to do when I determine that rate. I have to use their formula sheets to start with. So there's not anything in the district made up. It's us providing the input into their uh, spreadsheet, if you will. And what that involves is how many students do you think you're going to have and what your taxable values look like. So you take those two things into account, and that establishes the rate that you can levy for that millage. But each year, you have the ability to compensate for what happened the year before, because it is possible, if you remember, I'm giving you estimates on how much students, and the taxable value can grow during the course of a year. So every year, the state allows you to come back in, and when you come back in, they let you adjust. If you over-collected, uh, back in 17, 18, they would make you collect less this year. If you undercollected, they would let you collect more. So that rate's going to get established at 1.8090 mills. Um, that's up from last year for the very reason is we undercollected. If you remember, um, we had a pretty good return on our students. They, we were underestimating. We had more students. And the tax value did increase during the year. So we're allowed to collect a little more. So it's up 0.1276 mills. Um, one of the things you're going to be talking about after this is the summer tax collection for the city. The city will split that in half. So you'll see them do 0 0.9045 in their summer tax collection in the same. And know that anybody other than the city, they collect once, so they'll levy that whole 1.8090. Um, the actual bond debt millage that you passed in 2015, um, we get that millage rate based on what we have left to pay and what we're able to take in on our tax of value. And our financial advisor on the bond, PFM is the company's name, will tell us what we should levy. Now, even though you have two series, they look at the two series and put them together. So I have one number for you, and that will be 2.95 mils. That's up slightly, but that's to be expected as you go. Um, that's no, it's, it's the uh, same as what it was set originally, but as you do the two series, typically you're paying off one, and when the new one comes on, it jumps a little bit, and so then you have the two bonds working together. So we'll be back at 295, and next year you'll do the same thing and bring it back again. Okay? I think, Bob, you're going to be operating off yours and just go into it. Okay. Let me do this then. Stop doing anything. So maybe I can't work off mine. Hang on here. Cindy has the paper one. I got paper got for that. I was just seeing if I could bring it back up. All right. All right. We're due from paper copy. Um, budgets take both the revenue and the um, expenditures. Those are the two things we have to do. And so what we when we build the budget, we always start with our assumptions. So if I start with the revenue, I usually start with the state. There's two major areas. One would be the state aid foundation per pupil, and the other would be categorical aid. So the state aid foundation is we're really trying to determine is there is there not an increase in how much the state's going to give us. Well, it's a big unknown, as we said before, but we're going to do our best estimate. Up until the middle of last week, we had two estimates, one from the governor and one from the Senate. They both used, I shouldn't say that, one used a 2x formula, one used a 1.5 formula, and they estimated anywhere between $120 per student increase for Midland. We're always on the low end of that. We're like that half x formula. And someone else would get 240 and the Senate was 135 so someone else would get 270 The House came out at 90 and 180 but that was late last week. So as I've given you your packet ahead of time, too, uh, I'm estimating that we'll be at $100 per pupil, so that's going to be our assumption. 
Um, I would caution you in two things as I was going to say as we look at it, but as you hear me talk here, there are two major factors as we go through. And those two factors are how much are they going to give us per pupil and how many pupils do we have. And both those are things that we have to estimate. And I would tell you I would do that conservatively. So I've looked at this and um, I got another slide that's coming up on how many students, so I'll talk about that in a minute. But even when I say 100, if you get $20 more students, you know, that's one swing. If it comes in less than 100, that's another. At the same time, if I have 10 more students than I predict, it's another. So when you talk estimating, you really have to look at both numbers. And I think what we tried to do is make assumptions that cover us in a conservative fashion as long as things follow kind of the status quo. On the categorical aid, um, we do know that the 147 money in these categories go to different things, but this deals with retirement system, and anyone that's been on the board long enough knows that the state retirement costs can, or was, eating up our budgets dramatically. And what I would tell you is um, the 147A and C, and you don't have to know all the letters, but, but one is the cost, uh, cost offset, the other one is the rate cap. Um, those are both uh, assuming to be there. It does fluctuate based on their assumptions on who will be in our employee next year because it's going to fluctuate how much money they give you based on the retirement that they're generating. So that does fluctuate, so we know, or at least we're predicting that's going to be down somewhat. Um, we also know that retirement in general, so when you're looking at retirement in general, that um, our rates are going to be up about 1.4. Now, the way that is is because that cap that they give you floats just a little bit, and it's going to float about a 2.2% uh, for us. And then even our mix of employees make a difference. There must be 8 to 14 different employment plans. So as the people that are on the basic, that sounds bad, but that's the oldest formula there was, and then there's MIP, those are going away, and we're taking on more employees on the newest part of the retirement. Uh, plan And so our mix, how much do we have to contribute to retirement on average is creeping slightly up just because we're putting more into the new system than we did the old. So if I put those two together, we're projecting the retirement rates uh, cost in the district about an additional 1.4. We're still looking at maintaining the 31A at-risk funding that we've had. We don't see that as an increase even though the governor's proposal was there. That has not showed up that way in either the House or the Senate. Um, some of the grants, and I won't run through everything, but what we tried to do is look at the grants in the three proposals and see if there are any that seem to be missing, not going to be there, or if there were any that we thought we should keep in. So, for example, um, the safety grant that Brian got last year, um, it's not going to be there. So that's a chunk of money that was in our revenues that's not going to be there. Um, there was another 147E money, uh, which doesn't appear that it's going to be there, but we don't know. And there's, uh, I guess, a common one you might remember is the high school per pupil. They were giving us $25 per high school pupil. That's been out of everyone's plan but the governor. So that looks like it might go in. So we did remove those from the budget that I've put together here. Uh, the other thing I should remind you, most grants, not all, have a corresponding expenditure that goes with it. So even if we get some of those grants, then I'm going to increase expenditures because they have to go to particular items when they come in. So that's something you have to work with. Um, I was uh, going to make a reference to a chart, but let's just talk per pupil foundation allowances just a little bit here. Um, if we come in at the $8,631 that I'm projecting, I just wanted to give a reference to people. While that's an increase, I'd want you to know back in, I guess I'll call it our heyday, 2008 and 2009, um, $8,904 a kid. And we're just getting back, if we get the 100, to 8631 And of course, lots of costs have changed in that time. But it's just to show you where we're at. Uh, Midland has to be a district where, because of our taxable value, we do contribute a bigger percentage locally. Uh, state makes up the difference. You can look at other districts where the state's providing the bigger chunk of money because those districts do not have the ability or the taxable value that needs to be there. Uh, other major revenue assumptions you need to do so when you see some numbers, it uh, doesn't look quite the same. Remember, we also got a big STEM gift grant last year, 1.2 or 3, 1.25. 
Um, that won't be in there, so that's going to take the revenues down immediately. We also had a WE diversity grant, which is about 50000 and those both were fully received in 1819. Uh, the uh, countywide enhancement millage is going to be down about 6%. There's a little difference in how that gets distributed. Uh, the ESA can have a portion of that and some of the charters if they're Midland County students. So they're telling us to kind of project uh, that being down. Some of our special ed reimbursements and Medicaid reimbursements that, that deal with special education due to not providing those services or not being able to bill those services, and that will fluctuate from year to year. Looks like that number will be down. Um, again, that's just because we're not billing or not having those services. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk about the enrollment. Um, we do go with a consultant, you know that. And then we look at also what we know about the district. And so to be conservative, I'm projecting enrollment to be down by 30 students. Um, that would take us to a blended count of 7,651. I think that's conservative. Uh, if you uh, have in your packet, I know, uh, any of the enrollment charts or the blends that you see, uh, one of the biggest factors for our budgets kind of stabilizing and not being so dramatic year to year has been the student enrollment. And you'll see a leveling of the student enrollment as it goes through. And again, I want you to think in terms of um, you know, if those 30 students we don't lose and come in at where we are, you know, that's a swing of um, about 250,000. Um, if we don't get 100 and we only get 70, that's about 250. So right there, that would cover it. And that's one of the things we try to do is look at all those and kind of play them off each other so that we come up with what we think is a pretty good estimate of where we're going to be. Not telling you we've never been surprised, but we've been doing pretty good at, at beating that enrollment. Um, and uh, we've been pretty good at predicting where that money is going to come in at. Uh, like I said, you would see if, when the chart, and you guys have that chart in the budget narrative I gave you, but a real uh, leveling off of the enrollment trends as we go. And in fact, um, some of that enrollment bubble as it was decreasing, I had another chart in there that will show you that um, we kind of expected at one time that all the losses we had seen in elementary were going to continue to the high school. They haven't, and in some ways, the elementary's really stabilized on top of that, and that's, that's really what's happened is um, the kids that you were losing and saying, boy, the grades are getting this much smaller in K1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that didn't necessarily hold true in 6, 7, 8, 9, and up. Did they lose students? They did, but not at the rate that they were, and the elementary's really kind of stabilized itself for, for lots of reasons. Um, general fund, then. Let me just uh, give you a real quick here so you have the numbers, but the general fund revenues... Uh, what we're projecting for the budget in 1920 is $81,212,554. Um, the vast majority of that, 65.7% comes from the state. About 25.6% comes from our local tax. And then, of course, we have federal, and we have that enhancement millage, which is a transfer, and we have some other local revenue. Um, actually, our local property tax, that little piece of the pot, is bigger than you would see in most um, uh, districts, if they're doing that, you'd see a much bigger slice from the state. But again, that's our tax base. But uh, $81,212,554. On the expenditure side, again, we have to make some assumptions there. Um, we did do what we've commonly referred to our balance, our budget process. Wanted you to know that we continued that this year. Uh, we meet with all the buildings and departments and have them project to us their expenditures and what they need to do. Uh, we had or did try really hard to keep those spendings at eight, at the 18, 19 levels that they were at. Now, sometimes there's fluctuations in that a little bit, but that's what we tried to do. Um, I guess the one thing I'd want to tell you about that, and if I had to try to show that to you, but the biggie is that that kind of expenditure only makes up 14% of our budget or 15% at best. The vast majority of our expenditures are on personnel, 85 to 86% of that depending on where we are and what our makeup of employees are. So when we do that, there's, there's not a lot of money hidden in that part of it. I wouldn't want you to, to think that part. We do know, and you know this too, because we've just done the salary letter, we're looking at 2 to 3% salary increases and steps. Don't forget, uh, there was a time there when our employees were making concessions and they were not stepping, uh, which means they could move either up based on experience as they go or evaluation, depending on what employee group you're in. They also could move across, which means they could shift, be, say they got their master's degree to bachelor's. And that's back working again, so that's also a cost that's in there. Uh, for medical and vision, we have to make a projection because we don't get those numbers until September. 
Um, we know what they'll be for the first half of the year. We just don't know what the second half is. And we're projecting 5%. Uh, the 5% kind of protects us because it's only half a year. So even if it went to 10, we'd be in pretty good shape. Uh, we've had some pretty good numbers, but um, you know it, that can't hold off forever. So we'd rather be a little safe there. We do know dental's up 6.5%. Um, the other things that we're making assumptions on, uh, we've already mentioned our HSA contributions. I did want to mention to you it's going to be a little bit of an increase in expenditures for the HSAs this year coming up because if we do two-thirds in January, I'm doing half for July, right, and then another two-thirds. So within a, a budget year, I'm going to have slightly more than what would be a full year. It's going to even itself up after year, but that caused that to be slightly higher. Our federal allocations, now we're getting into some of the grant stuff, but you've heard us talk about Title I, Title IIA, Title I-D. Um, they're all allocated at basically 85% of what they were. The, fe the feds have tightened up their money there. And the other part of that is this budget does not include any carryover money because, A, we're not quite sure where that is, and we usually adjust for that at, at, uh, at, a, at adjustment time. And the other part would be is we're not going to have as much carryover. Um, we had quite a bit here, and we've spent most of that carryover, so those federal grant dollars are going to be down. Uh, that the same would be for 31A. While we're going to get that amount, we won't have the carryover that we did after that first year. That always fluctuates depending on what expenditures you had and what was left there. Um, could be less and less carryover if they keep funding us at 85% of what we had the year before. Uh, that causes things to happen that, that we don't really control. I do always, too, mention to everybody, we always look at our staffing patterns. I think that's the other thing that's been something that we've done. We really try to analyze vacancies, replacements. Do we need additional? Do we need to reduce? I think that's important we do. And I think sometimes, and I just wanted to say this, but that additional salary always comes with more than just that salary. People will often say to me, well, that, you know, that'll cost you a starting teacher's salary. They'll say that's, I don't care, 40000 and I just want people to realize that with that comes at least 50% of that in state retirement and FICA, and that's not the other benefits that come in there. So it's, it's often that, you know, if we took, uh, I think the average teaching center right now is in the $70,000, but say $70,000, there's going to be another thirty five dollars on top of that before we talk about the cost of benefits. Not complaining about that, but it's just important to know that's why we try to watch our staffing levels. We, we need to make sure they're important and that we can continue to provide them. That's the other thing. A lot of people look at staffing in the one-year term. Well, that's going to grow. So we always have to look at it and say, can we support this or are we creating something that's unsupportable as we go forward? So something that we try to do. That's one of our major expenditures. So you have a chart that you'll be able to see. And again, uh, you have copies. This will go on the web, at least the PowerPoint, not the presentation, but you'll be able to see the um, the PowerPoint itself, you can see the expenditures. Um, the chart that I have is a comparison between um, our budget we're proposing for 1920 and what we had in March of our 1819 budget. Um, tough to compare because I want you to remember a couple of things. Typically, March has every grant that we're ever going to get in there and everything that's there, and the starting budget typically does not have that. You would notice a couple of things. The expenditures are actually down. They're just not down as much as the revenues. Okay, so you put those two together, that's going to kind of get to our final line here. On the expenditure side, then, we uh, are looking at an expenditure of $83,117,259. And again, if you're just doing quick math in your head, you realize that at least in the beginning part that we will have to dip into fund balance for part of that difference because there is a difference. Before I leave expenditures, I would tell you again that the pie chart that you typically will see, it is 85 to 86% in personnel costs and the other things that are out there like the purchase services you do, the contracted services, supplies, capital outlays, a uh, much smaller portion of that, that part of the budget. And even if you look at it in terms of we've worked very hard uh, with that general fund expenditures, if you look at the amount of money that goes towards uh, classroom instruction, student support, instructional support. We still try to keep uh, a lot of our money in those areas. So you'll see that when you look at it, I think roughly about 77% of it. Um, the others, about 12.4. Administration of any kind, building any place, about 7. And business and HR, the things you need to keep a business running, about 3.5. 
So when we get to the gender fund snapshot, um, I guess I'd point out to you again, um, we're looking at budget of revenues for the 1920 budget of $81,212,554, and the budget expenditures of $83,117,259. That is a difference, and it's, uh, we'll have to dip into fund balance then for $1,904,705. So um, that's about 1.9 million. I mentioned a couple things to you. We always have had a variance. So when you get a chance to look at that in your packet, mm -hmm. um, the only thing I've changed there is I've typically been very, very conservative and projected it at 1%. I did project this one at 1.5 because in all honesty, in the last 10 years, it's been between two and three. So I think 1.5 is still a pretty good comparison. That would generate an additional uh, 1.2, almost 1.3 million. So the anticipated shortfall would be about 657,000. I want to mention a couple of things on that, if I could. Um, one is you are purposely going in the fund balance for at least a couple of things. So when you look at that amount after the variance, the 657,947, out of there, um, you are scheduled to spend out of your fund balance 205,000 from your STEM grant. Don't ever forget you put the money in there for a reason and that's one of the reasons. So that's there. Um, you're also going into your technology. Remember we siloed some things, assigned versus unassigned. One of them is technology. And if you remember, we've been switching over the middle schools to Chromebooks as the new sixth graders come in. So they get to keep using the same computers they had in elementary school. And so we're due to do another one of those and that's typically somewhere in the $180,000 range. At least that's what we earmarked. And there's a little bit of IB money, not very much in the diploma program, that would run itself out. So if I put those together in a purposeful way, what you put the fund balance together for, for some of those assigned restricted things, you're going to take out about $410,000 out of that $600,000. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, and I would show you, and I showed you at the budget workshop, um, I don't want you to think of it as, as a deficit budget. Your fund balance allows you to start the yes. year uh, with a balanced budget. Um, I gave you historically a 10-year run of what you had done previously. We've only, as, as late as 2015-16, if you want to call it an adoption where the expenditures exceeded the revenue, that you were still doing that. Now, by the time we get the variance and come in at the end, the last three or four years, we've been able to put money in that fund balance, which you need to do. Um, because that builds it, but that's not meant to be doing that all the time. In actuality, um, I ran a couple of things on this one just to see where we would be. If the average revenue percent of what we end up at the end audited and the average expenditures come in, you'll have a balanced budget. You will not actually touch your fund balance. If you get the extremes, Think of that two different ways, right? Worst I've ever seen the revenues come in compared to what you started with, and the worst I've seen the expenditures come in, then you could be closer to losing that uh, 650 or taking that out of fund balance um, up to you know the full 1.9 uh, if you had no uh, change there. But I would tell you that the um, that's really not what the averages would tell us would happen on that one. In, no matter which case you look at, um, I looked at the variance to cover it all. would take about 2.3, and we're looking, that would be right in the wheelhouse of where you've been. And like I said, um, our job's not to, our job's to put a fund balance together that's healthy, allows you to do lots of things, but it's not to become just a continual bank of things you do, and that's one of the steps you've taken to budget. Uh, the other part I looked at was, so you would have an idea, you see lots of different fund balances. People are going to give you lots of different percentages. There's just how much is in the fund balance. Then there's what we call the restricted and the unrestricted. And then restricted is gifts that can't be spent for anything else. We've been trending, and those numbers are, are, are higher. And you'll see those in some of the charts you have in there. The other number they had for you, just so you would know, is what we're now calling the unassigned fund balance. Because not only do we have those gifts that are there and inventory we've paid for, a uh, little bit of workman's caps we serve, but we've been uh, siloing money for copiers and technology because the bond doesn't last forever in those areas. 
and they're both going to come up down the road someplace. So we're trying to set the money aside so when we get there, it's not such a hit to the general fund. It's already been saved and sitting there. And when we look at that part, um, we would be looking at about at the end of next year, if all that variance comes true, 18.7% in that unassigned, which is still a very healthy place to be. If you just talk about total fund balance, you're going to be 22, 23%. Depends on where we end this year, to be honest with you. As do all these numbers. Because don't forget, every time we do this, I'm giving you one fund balance, and I will do that next uh, board meeting on the 18, 19 numbers. But it's still that audit that comes in, and you know what actually got expended. Because we're going right up to the last day of June. Um, whether that came in, didn't come in, the auditor wants us to attribute it to this year, next year, all those points that come into being. So again, uh, this is one that uh, you still have a, a pretty uh, healthy uh, general fund balance. Um, you still <clears throat> are uh, you know, at a point where you're purposely going in to spend some of the money, but in the same token, I really do feel when I look at it that when we, when we get to the end with the variance, that this is, in essence, a balanced budget that's really tough to do. Now, with the uncertainty of the state, Mike's mentioned this a couple of times, but I think it's really important we talk about it. It's possible you're going to have to do an extra adjustment next year. I mean, if you know in October or November, hey, the, the student count was way wrong and the state gave us more or less, you might decide, um, Brian might decide, and Lori might decide, they want to do an adjustment earlier because when, when that's unknown, you know, that's a bigger number. Now, don't remember, we won't know numbers until we hit the October count day. So that's why October would be a it tough It would be one. my recommendation we do not getting a state budget until late fall. So. Yes. And so at that point, that's the budget where we're at. And again, um, I, I get one last chance, I guess, to, to thank the people. It is a uh, major undertaking to put a budget together. Um, and so I can't, I got to thank Lori Holderby in the business office. They, they do the hardest part of the work. I get to talk to you about it. And they put in a lot of time. And then... It takes every department on an $81 million revenue or an $81, $83 million expenditures. Um, it takes a lot of people out there to, to analyze how they want to spend their numbers. Um, you know, my job is to question them always to make sure it's something we really need. Um, but in, in essence, without the departments, the building principals, um, all the financial people that help us out there, um, all those people thinking about those things. It's hard to put a budget together for you, but I didn't want you to think it was a singular effort. It never is. Like I said, Lori really pulls the bulk of the, the work she has to do, most of the heavy lifting on it. So that's the budget. Uh, it does, uh, certainly I'd answer any questions for you. And of course, we always follow it with um, by law public hearing on the budget. So I, if there's any questions and I can help, please ask and I'll do the best I can answering for you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Comments? I had a couple. Sure. Uh, great job, Bob uh, and Lori and the whole crew. We're just uh, looking at a couple lines. We have plant repair and maintenance and sinking fund. And then in another spot, we talk about sinking fund and prime. Prime program? PR me. That's the capital projects fund. It was always referred to as plant okay, PRM. repair. Plant repair, maintenance, and equipment. Okay. So back before 94, this district actually, when they set their own millage rates and you were collecting everything locally, they put in, I think it was a one mill, but they came <coughs> up with that every year, and that's how they funded capital projects. Of course, they went away the year ability to do that. Probably so we've like tried, and one of the things, you, if you look at the sheets, you'll notice we've been trying to put some money back into that fund so when things come outside the bond, you have it. The sinking fund was money left from the sinking fund. And that board decided back then to hold the last little bit they had. It was just under a million. Um, not forever, because that was voted on by your public to use it to repair things. But it was at a time before they had the bond. Your last and, collection on sinking fund was 2014. Yeah. So we've made that dollar, those dollars spread. The intent was to spend them. And so we have sinking funds, the new terminology after Proposal A. PRME was before and sinking fund would be uh, pay as you go, collect taxes, spend it the following year, but only on repair. It's not to build. Okay. So with the plant repair and maintenance and sinking fund, we should be aware that we may need more money 
in those categories because of yeah, we still in aging infrastructure a and things that we, aren't being upgraded through the bond. We would do two things. The sinking fund would only be if you voted one in because that, that goes away once you spend it. Mm -hmm. The other part I tell you in the capital improvement, we've been trying to put money away this year, and we will try as if we can at all, as we close on eighteen nineteen, put a little more. There is not at this time any money going in in nineteen twenty, just because where we're at. If that turns around, we would uh, you'd absolutely right, Brad. We would want to make sure that you you keep putting some money there because even when you look at it now, do not forget um, that's where the press box is, the insurance money for it, etc. There are I, things. I would take it a step further too, Bob. So we we need that's priority one is to continue to build into the capital funds because we have funds for the academic interventions. The second one is we built that bond with the idea that there would be an opportunity to have a zero tax increase. We've been not, not able to pin down our consultants yet on what that date would be. And it is a goal of mine because I asked about every few months. I want to know what that date is. And most likely I may not be the guy around by then, but we set that up responsibly to, be, to continue. But I do think there's going to be a gap when the bond work's done, not the technology money, that's that last series, mm -hmm. when the bond work and our buildings are done before we can do that zero increase going forward. So a zero increase would be going to the citizens and saying, and, and remember when we sold the bond, we said this all along. Um, if, you can, if you would vote to continue to pay the same rate for, a long, next, for another additional so many years, it would bring in this income. You have, to, you have to figure it out. Now the other one is you had a sinking fund, and, and you let it expire in 2014. A sinking fund is... So you do major upgrades to your home, and you borrow to do so. Um, somewhere down the road, you would like to be able to maintain it as you go, right? Put money aside out of your check, and each year do a project. That's what the sinking fund's for. I think we should also pull our citizens at some point and say, would you be interested in a, and sinking funds are small, usually typically 0.5 to 1. It might be even cap, Lori. Is it 1, 1.5? One There's a cap somewhere in there. You can only go so big. But... For this district, that's a fairly large number mm -hmm. that you could bring in and main, do your ma maintenance project each year. I've had the question asked by the foundations or the Dow High Field is, um, where's the district's capital funds project? Well, there really isn't one, by the way. School, what we're doing in capital funds is unique. School districts, when the proposal came in, they did not plan for capital improvement through, the, through that revenue source. You can only go out for bond or sinking. And so it's a tax increase, or a ta keep your tax going in order to do so. So to squirrel away money to do capital improvements when 85% of it is personnel is a difficult one to do. We're doing a decent job on it, but um, so hopefully that answers the thorough mm -hmm. part of your question. Yep. Okay. Uh, great questions, Brad. Uh, so 1.9 mil sounds a little daunting, uh, but it's just a potential deficit, right? Uh, I, th I think the big takeaway is that we've worked hard to position ourselves to weather this storm if it ever comes to fruition. Um, so there's a lot of optimism, Bob, that you've given us um, and a lot of things to look forward to, and I appreciate that. Um, again, you guys have done a tremendous job um, putting this forward. And just to, to reiterate, uh, this is going to be on our website, right, for anybody who wants yep. to take a look at it. And for those of you who um, have joined us tonight, if you'd like a hard copy, um, I think we could probably get you one after the fact because uh, we didn't have a presentation. When for the you. printers get up running, too, they're <laughs> down too. <laughs> yeah, we can't copy right now, but yeah, we publish the PowerPoints right on the website, so it'll be right there. Same documents that I just read off. Of. Any other comments? All right, all right. Moving on, three point four. At uh, this point, I will open the floor um, for comment on the public hearing of the twenty nineteen twenty. Uh, general operating budget only. So if there's anybody who would like to come up and address the board, now's the time to do so. Okay, we'll close the floor and uh, move on to our summer tax rate. Continuing with Mr. Cooper. Yeah, what we always have to do, because the city is trying to print your tax bills if you live in the city, they want to know how much should they levy uh, uh, for, especially the hold harmless millage. Um, and so that's what you have in front of you. Um, it's not the um, countywide one that goes out. Typically, I've been doing that in July to September, depending on when we get it figured out. Brian, Brian will take care of that. Um, 
that one will feel very much like this one. This is just to get to the city to let them know how to split it. Um, the important part is where you get to the now therefore be it resolved, uh, not the other parts of the statement. Um, but basically you'll look and, and it talks about the 18 mills I talked about being split nine and nine and talks about that hold harmless millage being split at 1.8090 uh, into 0 0.9045 twice. And uh, the, the uh, commercial personal property is a six mil by state uh, requirement and that's three. And our 2.95 on our bond uh, would be separated into 1.475 uh, both in the summer and the winter collection. So that's what this does. After you pass it, I send it on to the city. They're waiting patiently, uh, and then they get to print your tax bill. So it's just telling the city that you're splitting uh, the roles and asking for it that way. Okay. Um, this is an action item, so we uh, will need a motion and a roll call vote. I move to approve the resolution certifying the tax rate that is to be levied in the summer of 2019 on the property of the school district within the city of Midland. A complete copy of the resolution shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Support. Okay. Moved by John. Support by Mary. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Can. President Singer is absent. Vice President Harland? Yes. Secretary Baker? Yes. Treasurer Fidel? Yes. Member Blasey? Yes. Member Lauterbach? Yes. And Member Rausch? Yes. Okay, motion passes. All right, moving on, item 3.6. This is the superintendent's contract renewal. Um, and just to introduce this a little bit, um, every year in December, the Board of Education formally reviews uh, Mr. Sherrill's performance. And following the most recent review, uh, the board has unanimously given Mr. Sherrill an overall performance rating of highly effective. This is the highest rating possible and is based among and in among other things including student growth, district goals, and five key performance categories uh, which are made of uh, governance and board relations, community relations, staff relations, business and finance, and instructional leadership. And with that being said, I will take a motion to extend Mr. Sherrill's contract one year, uh, which will take him through 2024. Is that correct, Mike? Yes. Okay. So moved. Support. Any comments? Moved by John, support by Phil. I'm sorry, Cindy. Um, Lynn, any, any comments? Oh, I, thought you were I was just going to, say, going to say it's it's a pleasure to be able to renew it. I think Mike's been great leader and in so many areas and um, we look forward to that added year. Mike, I'll also say that, um, you know, and I've said this before, you're a leader by example and I think that's a big difference between um, being a leader and being a boss. Uh, people respect that um, and just to kind of highlight that, uh, your wage increase is, is in line with the other work groups. Uh, you know, you're not taking anything exorbitant. In fact, um, you frequently take less than uh, your peers, um, and you continue to do an outstanding job. Um, you're accessible to us on a very regular basis. Uh, you're accessible to your board member, to your fellow administrators, uh, to your teachers. You're an excellent communicator. Uh, you keep us very well informed of issues within the district that could uh, affect the board. Um, our district is performing academically at some of the highest levels in the state. Our achievement gap is continuing to close. And you continue to innovate and come up with new and creative ways to stretch our budget and to ensure that the maximum amount of dollars are being put into the classroom where they belong. Uh, so a few reasons why I'm very happy to have you here. Um, so is there any other discussion before we uh, well take said. a vote? Well yeah, said. Can't, can't say anything better than that. Thanks. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Mike, thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, item number four, request to address the board. Anybody like to come up and address the board at this time? No? Okay. Moving on to five, uh, curriculum instruction and assessment. Ms. Miller-Nelson. Actually, 
Yeah. I'm sorry, did I miss something? Yeah, we just have, you only uh, have study minutes, committee it? minutes. That's all we have. Oh, just, okay. Yes. Yep, I have those. Many, Penny's not spending any money tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay, Lynn's got the minutes then. Yep. We met at the Building Trades House on Monday, May 20th, which is always one of our favorite meetings. Um, Kevin Dodick, Building Trades teacher, and Bill Brown, City of Midland Building Department liaison, and the Building Trades students discussed the overall Building Trades project and partnership for the 2018-19 school year. This year's partnership included the City of Midland and Habitat for Humanity. The students provided the tour and shared details about the learning experiences they had with the various aspects of construction, including framing, electrical, HVAC, plumbing, and finished carpentry. The students expressed great pride in knowing they are giving back to the community through this construction project. This opportunity was also used to recognize seniors graduating from the Building Trades program and to celebrate that nearly all are entering post-secondary programs or careers in the skilled trades area. And we will resume our meetings in September of 2020. And it, as always, it's just amazing to me what these students can build with the, with the guidance of the, the adults and their mentors. And another beautiful home. And really exciting that they were able to partner with Habitat for Humanity this year. And um, some of the students, they had the students placed in each of the rooms. So it was kind of neat. They... They really took pride, as it says, in sharing what they did and what they learned in whether they were working in the kitchen, the bedroom, the bathroom, and how much they learned. And uh, so, as always, one of my favorite meetings. Okay, Lynn, thank you. Uh, item number six, facilities, finance, and operations. And it looks like uh, some minutes from me, Mary. Yeah. Um, we met on June 3rd. Uh, Mr. Dombro from uh, Barton Mallow provided the FFO committee with a construction update and bond work list uh, review and the summer 2020 project process uh, update. Uh, Mr. Cooper reviewed and discussed the items that uh, we've already looked at, April financial reports, upcoming summer tax resolution and millage rates, um, the 2019-2020 um, employee salary letter and the 2019-2020 proposed budget and the superintendent's contract and compensation. Okay. Thank you. Item 6.2 uh, is going to be Mr. Cooper. Yeah, for your information only tonight, we have seven gifts totaling $5,456. And while that kind of slows down here at the end, because we do slow them down as we're trying to close out the books, it will start back up. But I did want to point out just two of them. They're there for lots of different things, but people often ask. Um, you'll notice food service scholarships from a couple different groups there. And so uh, that from time to time becomes uh, an item out in the community they talk about. We have a very generous community. Uh, that would just be a smattering. Lori would tell you that, that we get lots of individuals and groups that want to donate some money for... Uh, students that are not able to pay their lunch bills and, and we try to do all that quietly so it's not a very well-known thing nor would we want it to be we just go in and take care of balances and there's lots of people in the community to help but there's two that are there that I thought would be nice to point out to you okay thanks Bob uh, and as always thank you uh, to all of our donors they are uh, very gracious and we're very blessed to have um, these gifts coming to our district uh, every meeting um, so moving on to number seven, uh, human resources. Uh, Mike, you're listed as the... Yep, okay. I'll take that one right. if you don't mind. Uh, we have one retirement to announce tonight, and that's Ann Bennett, a paraprofessional over at Seabury Elementary, and that retirement took effect on May 30th. Okay, thanks, Brian. Yes, um, item number eight is just kind of listed in the uh, agenda as upcoming meetings. Uh, moving to item number nine, uh, correspondence to and from the Board of Education is identified in the agenda and will also be uh, listed on the broadcast of this meeting, if I understand that correctly. Is that right? Okay. Uh, for number 10, study discussion, uh, we're going to do it a little different tonight. Um, if, if there are any board members who would like to see a topic of future study brought to a committee, um, please feel free to speak up. Otherwise, uh, we're going to waive the personal comments tonight and just give the floor to Mike. Anybody? Okay, Mike, the floor is yours. Wow. Um, Dow High Event Center. So 
the citizen committee um, who's been working on that project submitted um, their grant application to the foundations uh, we were asked to d turn around and do that for them that they were not a 5013c we need to do as our organization and so um, as I wrote you um, I did so and we wanted to be um, take the stance at least to be a neutral on this project and um, I tried to answer the questions the best I can and, and saying that would, would the, a turf area be nice for this district? It would, but it wasn't our top priority um, with some of the academic things or other capital projects we may have um, in the district as well. So we'll see where that goes from there. But I think we did what we were supposed to do on that piece of it. Um, bond and capital improvement projects, busy summer. Um, maybe even not as big as dollars, some of them, but it's, it's five or six different sites out there going on, and so there's a little bit of management there. Um, we seem to be on schedule. The rain has not helped on the Adams edition particularly. It's a little behind on the bricks and, or the foundation on that because the mortar and the wetness of that. So, um, But that one, you know, always opens up later in the school year, so n not a big issue on there as well. So at this point, Adams is cleaned out, and by the end of the weekend, it was um, completely um, demoed, and so we're, we're, we're doing very well so far on all of those pieces going forward. As Bob mentioned, the House released its budget. We weren't sure we were going to see a House version, and it wasn't necessarily a real friendly version either to us. So uh, we'll see where all those goes. They had the benefit, though, of knowing that the uh, revenue, last revenue consensus showed that growth wasn't as big as expected. Not down, but not as big as expected. And so um, the truth probably lies somewhere in between. There's three vastly different budgets now. It was semi-close in some categories, but not in others, so it'll be interesting to see them work through this process. I think Phil went to a meeting today and listened to some of that as, you, as we went. So, ALICE, if you remember the acronym ALICE, we introduced that last August. We went and sent two uh, people from every building to be our trainers, to be an in-house trainers, and now we are scheduled to um, begin to practice those in each building this year. We'll practice, readjust, uh, reteach, and by the end of the year, we hope to run a full scale exercise with Alice and determine if we're ready to call ourselves as an Alice district in the, in the um, fall of 20, uh, meaning it's another technique for teachers to be able to use in, in a moment of crisis. And so uh, we're moving forward on that. Crisis Go, we fully implemented that. They practiced using their with their drills, and so we're um, moving along pretty well with that. I, it, the tool actually itself continues to grow and become more powerful. Um, and we'll continue to try to use that in different ways as well because it has a lot more power to it than actually w what all we're doing with the alert system on this piece. Digital radios are in, going. we a little frustrated. we got a little dead spot in the district. Uh, I think Bob would be glad he's not the guy dealing with it going forward, but we're working with the company best we can, and um, it may cause us to have to purchase a repeater in a couple areas. Um, what we were promised on coverage isn't is coming through all the way on that. So a little work on that, but the digital radios are a nice tool as well going forward. So restorative practices, um, as you know, we've been um, training our staffs, beginning to work on that. Um, we're going to try to apply that to our data suspension at the end of the year. We've always looked at our student discipline data and our suspension data, um, but now we're going to set some target growth areas of decline. A couple buildings did that this year and um, showed some really nice inc um, decline in the middle school. You know, past, we have a um, past program there, so that's helped really nice, but maybe time to expand that and move on. The last one I'll close with tonight is Michigan Department of Ed released finally the guidance on the third grade reading initiative and where those cut scores will be. Um, it was probably good news for us as we were um, a bit panicked about um, would we ha be having a lot of retention talks with a lot of parents? And it, it was a very few, when I say few, single digits, um, district-wide. And so that would be a good thing if it stays that way. But a large group there that still needed interventions. So they wouldn't be retained but still needed interventions. So that we're, that's where our target will be and our growth area will be with the third grade reading legislation. So it's now called Read by Grade 3. Um, so you know what that is going forward. And that's all I have since it was a short two weeks from between meetings. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, item 11, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank, Thank you very much, everybody.